Greetings, welcome to dinner, and a painting, with Jeremiah Paulacek. I'm kind of in this mode now of trying to keep them a little bit secret before, mm. so that I can have a body of work to show. Yeah. Um, but I've actually kind of been really reclusive with my work in general for a couple of years now. And I think Just it's in the studio, or yeah. I mean, I've had shows, but I feel I don't know. It's good to think about. Um, I think actually the part of the truth is like since I finished the field guide project, mm -hmm. I've really felt like I've been in transition with the work, and I'm actually I'm realizing how long the transition period can be, and so I feel like it's a little bit delicate, and also. The thing that I am noticing more and more, though, is how I will get, like, there's certain things that people love to comment on about my work. One, mm -hmm. especially, is the text. Okay, right. People go to text immediately. And, and I notice more and more how arbitrary it's like, some people love it, some people hate it. Some people love it, you should take it out, yeah. you should leave it, you should take it out. So I feel like I'm kind of in this in-between stage of letting the work evolve but also just observing people's reactions more so that I can evolve as the painter who really fully does what I feel like I need to do because mm -hmm. I can kind of see this constant like the reaction there's like I said there's so few people who I feel like they say something that really cuts to the core of what I'm doing or it's like the thing that I really need to hear mm -hmm. that um, mostly I'm just kind of hearing the preferences I guess right more than anything and that doesn't do much for me it's do you remember a time do you remember what something you needed to hear was a comment from a um, somebody that steered your work in a new direction or transformed it there's it's it's less so for me that it gets steered in a new direction but that I kind of get anchored into an understanding of what I'm actually doing. And I feel like that moment will change. If the work is going to change, it's almost dependent on that moment happening. Mm -hmm. And there's really been, I'm trying to think, there's only really been a handful. Like I remember when I first started working in this style, and like I said, I was working on file folders before. Yeah. Uh, I had a professor in grad school who, he said to me, you know, if these weren't beautiful, nobody would give a shit. And that for me, really kind of cut to the heart of so much of what I was doing. It's like, there's these things I want to talk about and these places I want to go with the painting. Yeah. And it is very dependent on whether or not they're aesthetically interesting enough for somebody to engage with them. Because I think before that I was a little naive and thinking, people should just care about the content. And isn't it lovely that we all have right. something we want to say or engage with? but they need that entrance point somehow. And I think I I kind of feel like I am at a, I don't know if you felt this, but I'm at a slightly dangerous point in my career where I know, I almost know too much about my work. Mm. Like I, I kind of know a little too much at this stage like that. He said that probably 10 years ago and it was really yeah. important. And now I feel a little bit like I, I could rest sort of on that understanding instead of really pushing into new territory mm -hmm. and letting go of some of the things that needed to be there before to kind of carry the work and the content. Yeah. So what, did they change during this? Did the actual paint application change or the colors or these sort of things? I mean, more what recently? Changed? Well, yeah, with this transition, like how did it change? More geometry versus figured it like figures and the forms used to be I think they used to be a lot more emotional before and I used to think of some of the figures as being emotional bodies mm -hmm. and then I remember the moment where I felt like I needed to use my ruler in the paintings and I was so sort of like anti-ruler it just seemed okay. too uptight and too tight and then something shifted because I started using a ruler and bringing in triangles and geometry yeah and I couldn't explain it, but I was really excited by it. And so it's like, I think they became a lot more, a little bit more architectural and refined mm -hmm. and clean. And they lost some of the messy, gritty 
raw element that was so emotional and that people really loved before. Okay. And so I'm kind of dealing now with people not loving the new direction as much. Yeah. And w I mean, when you say like before, would they like sloppier, like more like paint, like splashing, more of this sort of thing happening? Yeah, they're kind of sloppier that way. Um, the surfaces tend to be covered more, and it was a lot. Um, it was like there's a lot more unfinished edges and scrawly, scribbly text, and okay. they're more angsty. Okay. It's tough with text. Text is really difficult. Don't you, I mean, what do you think? Or is it more natural for you? I know with me, I did it a couple times, like just, and it can obviously take over the work so fast because somebody can look at it and be like, oh, I get that. That says texture or something. And that becomes the piece. Yeah, I feel kind of lucky that way in text. And it feels really natural to me, so much so that it feels like you know, that intuitive moment where I know, use this color or use this marker or make this mark. It's mm -hmm. like, put this word on. So it never feels like I'm being didactic or that it's going to like take over. It feels like it's just one of the mediums. Yeah. So it's always just kind of flowed really naturally. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happened for me is, at, like I'm no longer, you know, a 27 year old woman struggling with the same things I was at 27. Mm -hmm. And so I've evolved and I feel like it's that thing where sometimes we revere the young, angsty art that feels so edgy and raw. But thank God I'm not that person. Like, I'm not, I don't have the same struggles anymore. So I don't <laughs> yeah. need to tap into that same thing to make the work. But text, where would you, where would you say you get it from when you say you know it? Like, it's, what type of process do you go through? It's just in my head. It's like I think the way language, like I've always... Mm, yeah, I've always had that kind of relationship to language, mm -hmm. meaning there's always like I can see the words in my head or I'm, I'll am i kind of get OCD about repeating sentences or phrases. Mm -hmm. And even when I was little, I used to keep myself up at night just with words running through my head. And so it feels that like when I'm in the process, a sentence or a phrase or a word will come. It's mm -hmm. not like I premeditate it and think, put this in there. It just kind right. of comes and I do it. Is that how you usually make work? Like, I, I know with um, teaching that often you're supposed to write this thing called a statement of intent. Mm -hmm. Do you know this whole deal? Yeah. And for me, I, I read a study where it said that you're actually less likely to, like if you're going to quit smoking, if you tell people that you're going to quit smoking, you're actually less likely to quit smoking. Like before it used to be like, tell everyone so then you feel guilty and they'll bug you, but the people that tell people their intentions are actually less likely to do it, which I mm. thought was kind of interesting. But it brought up the idea for me when I make it a new work, I don't know if it's similar to you, there doesn't need to be a plan, really, or is that how you work as well? Absolutely. Yeah. I find that there tends to be sort of two general categories for artists. The ones who are using the work to explore a clear set of questions, and then the ones who make the work and then connect more to what it's about or what the questions are. Mm -hmm. like that, and I'm of the second category where it has to be really intuitive and I just have to do it yeah. because somehow the, for me, something changes in my thinking when the brush or the pencil hits the canvas. Yeah. It's like I can't access thoughts in the same way as I can when I'm painting. So it's like I, it doesn't work for me to have a plan yeah. ahead of time. I've tried. I did too, yeah. It doesn't make sense to me either. There's also the problem of, or it's a strange balance, I think. There's an Auerbach, Auerbach or Frank Auerbach was interviewed, and I remember he talked about like kind of endlessly like doodling on paintings, and like, you know, you shouldn't paint like you're just, you know, you should be thinking about, you shouldn't just be reacting kind of because then it's just prettiness. There has to be some struggle there, otherwise you're like mm. twiddling your thumbs, mm. so to speak. You know what I mean? Like there has to be this bridge or some balance between intent and execution and pleasure <laughs> of smearing colors. You know, just smearing colors around is nice, you know, when you talked about little kids, but yeah. Yeah. 
Do you feel yourself holding yourself back at times, like restraining yourself? Well, I'm trying to think of what the struggle is in my case. Like, I could see some people might have the struggle of, I want to explore something or get to something. Mm -hmm. And maybe they started out more spontaneously or intuitively, and then they can't, then they have to negotiate what was the intention or what was I going in with, with what it is now. But, I mean, there's always a struggle for me in a painting. But it, it's more, um, I think for me, the struggle is to truly get to that point where, um, like I, I let it become what it wants to be. So I think it's almost the opposite, like, Mm -hmm. because there's so many moments in it where I can get enamored with a form, the way it's looking, how clever I think I am. And then I can always feel when it goes into that phase of this is kind of too easy and too obvious and if I left it here, it would never kind of come to like really take on a new form or come to a conclusion. So Mm -hmm. there's always the struggle for me is that moment of recognizing that and knowing I have to now destroy something that I love in order for it to become something like really yeah. become something do you feel do you have any early memories of paintings like do you remember your first experience I know you, you oh God. heard that you claim that you grew up in a or not claim but <laughs> <laughs> you uh you did grow up like in a rural area right yeah I grew up on a farm okay yeah with really no arts culture anything okay so what happened for me was I was always the kid who was making stuff. I was, I don't think I actually, I tried to paint in high school. Okay. It wasn't easy. What I was really good at was using pe- colored pencils to reproduce magazine photographs. Right. Impeccably. A lot of people do that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So I remember when I kind of happened to end up in art school. Okay. And. How did that happen? I was always the kid who was making stuff and then there's that moment in high school where you have to decide what you're going to do with your life and I thought I would go on to study math because I loved math and I was really good at it mm-hmm. and then my one of my best friends in high school we were just talking about things and she said you know you're always making stuff and I think she had pulled out or my mom had pulled out this box of I was always making cards and gifts and things for people but I was good at art. Like, I was good at it in high school. I could draw yeah. what I saw. And so how she many people said, were in your class in high school? I mean, like, was it 30 people or yeah, something? Yeah, it was an yeah. average size okay. class. And so, so there was she, the kid who could draw and the kid who was a skater and sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, we had an art class. I was kind of that kid who was kind of good at everything. Right? I was smart. <laughs> like, really, it was kind of, I mean, I was like... I had the best grades, I could yeah. draw, I was great at volleyball, mm-hmm. except I was completely socially awkward, that wasn't my strength, but like okay. I, was, I just could do everything academically, even creatively really well. So this friend said to me, you know, maybe you should think about art school. And then this is the weirdest part, is that somehow my dad talked to some guy in the factory where he worked, whose kid was going to art school in Detroit. Okay. And my dad got a catalog from him and brought it home to me. And that's the art school I ended up going to. Really? So it was... Did you look at paintings much before then? Oh, God, no. I no. Was, no. So you came in kind of cold into art school in a way. I remember because I started out in actually graphic... It was graphic communication at the time. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember thinking, that. right, somebody had to design the box of cereal. Yeah. I didn't know that was a job. Right. Yeah. So I was, my whole world was being opened up. I mean, I had zero exposure, really. I had a high high school art class. So then I started out doing graphic design. Okay. And then I gravitated towards illustration. Then I technically graduated from illustration. Okay. All right. But then I migrated to the fine arts painting side. And it was so painful. Art making was so painful for me, but I knew I had to do it. Because you were used to like doing things properly, or Probably you wanted to be good at it. Probably partially the perfectionist, or? but then it was just the inner critic. Mm-hmm. It was just like a shitstorm of 
inner voices telling me how awful I was and how much I sucked and throwing the towel and what are you thinking and I just felt like I was losing my mind. <laughs> and did the teachers say the same? Were they tough? Or were they... No, I was good. I mean, yeah. by all accounts, I was... Yeah. The work... I always did the work. It was pretty good work. I didn't have those teachers who were really hard on me. Yeah, okay. It was just me. I didn't need... I was just me. <laughs> So there wasn't a time when you were just like in despair because of what somebody said or some realization you hit in art school where like, oh, okay. Not really. This isn't, okay. And not in that way. No, mm-hmm. it was mostly self-imposed. <laughs> yeah. It could be worse, probably. Okay. I mean, I had a couple moments, you know, I applied, f- well, there was one, I applied for grad school. Mm-hmm. And one of my professors, I had asked him to look at my slides and my essay. Slides. I remember those, too. My slides. <laughs> I remember he said to me, he read my essay, and he's like, this is complete gibberish. I don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> good. <laughs> if somebody showed me that, eh, that's true. <laughs> that's a good teacher, though. To, the easy way out is just to be like, oh, it's all right. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I did not know what I was talking about. And he yeah. called me out on it. Yeah. Was there certain painters or artists that were influential, like, immediately, that you saw and then you're just like... Yeah, Cy Twombly. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. And he already came up previously when we were talking, too. So when when you saw Cy Twombly, I know Cy, I know he actually had a fairly strange life. Wasn't he, like, part of, like, this really, like, wealthy culture or something like this? I don't actually know that much about his story. I think he was, like, married to, like, this incredibly wealthy woman, and he was part of, like, this very, like, ritzy culture. Because when you see his works, you think they're very, like, guttural, and Ah. he's the guy in the garret slaving away, but he was actually part of this, like, upper crust, which is strange to think when you think, yeah. I didn't know that. No, I'll never forget the moment. It was second year of art school. I was in a contemporary art class, most of which mm-hmm. I had not been exposed to at all before. Yeah. And I saw his work and the scribbles, and I thought to myself, it's enough to make a mark. And that kind of changed everything for me. Yeah. Like just, And it, it was connected to that, just that fundamental act of making a mark, and also what can come through, like we were talking about kids' drawings. Yeah. Like the incredible amount of... like kind of quote-unquote information but the sincerity that can come through in a mark too sure and the primitive the primitive nature of it how inherent it is to being human in so many ways like just making a mark do you think that their art schools work do you think you learned something did you learn something at art school or what did you learn at art school maybe that's a better question i that's such a good question i kind of feel like i've always gone in the back door so Mm -hmm. I think what I learned in undergrad were some fundamentals of drawing and composition kind of the basic stuff that you need to know enough of so you never have to really think about again yeah Um, I think that was the most important thing and I know the thing that I I, like I said I kind of always went in the back door so I wasn't studying fine art but then I was in the fine art painting side because I felt like I couldn't I knew that if I kind of claimed it or tried to follow a path or a tradition too closely, it wouldn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So I was like doing illustration and some photography and fine art and some sculpture and just kind of piecing it together. So I think undergrad gave me those fundamentals and some exposure to what was possible. And then grad school... For me, I went to a place where I could get into what was missing for me in undergrad, which was the creative process itself. Okay. And I got to explore that and gain some understanding of it. The actual, how do you, how would you say the creative process works? Can you teach it? I don't know that it's, it's so, I don't know that it's so teachable, but I think that there's patterns to probably all of our creative processes that we can come to recognize Mm -hmm. and know what to expect a little bit more like I always equate it to can you imagine if a woman 
who was giving birth, and nobody had ever told her to expect contractions or labor pains. <laughs> yeah. You, you'd think you were dying and it was the end of the world. Yeah. So I think that there are some definite patterns that we can see. And or creating the right environment knowing to have them creating the right conditions, what works, what doesn't work, well, these kind of things. You see yourself like as a mentor, or maybe not see yourself as a mentor, you work as a mentor to people too, in this respect, to like create, make people more creative or break down these barriers and this sort of thing. Yeah, I think we, you know, it's called coaching, but it's basically like the midwife is mm-hmm. a lot of how it is. Like I basically... I get to help other artists who have struggled in the way I have to make art. So, you know, I was never that kid that that was my sanctuary or that was the place where, and I remember when I was first in art school and people would say, oh, it's like this timeless state of bliss and time stands still and it's so (laughs) amazing. And I remember thinking I'm totally in the wrong place because this is so painful. Mm. And so for me, it became... I mean, I was always really interested in the creative process. And there's always been a part of my work, too, that has been about community and social practice as well. Mm -hmm. And how do I get it outside of the gallery? Mm -hmm. And so it took me a long time to really figure out that the thing that I am so passionate about is the creative process itself. And if I can create some kind of container or space for other artists to really go to that place that is so painful, so they can get something really good out of it. Yeah. And then I, I, I love it. I feel like I'm... Bad. And how do you do, do you do these through Skype, mainly? Most they, of, I, yeah, most of it is online, Skype, uh-huh. group coaching calls. Mm-hmm. So if people were interested in it, how would they go about finding you? JessicaSaran.com. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the Yellow Brick Road. Yeah, yeah, it's all there. I mean, the website is actually geared a lot more towards the coaching than my art at this point mm-hmm. okay and you feel like with um, with coaching people have you had certain techniques that are successful often more often than not or is every person completely different it's not actually that different I feel like the thing my job is to essentially give people permission to acknowledge the impulses and the desires. So mostly what I have to do is listen for that place where somebody is, they want to do something, but they feel like they can't or they shouldn't, and they stop themselves. Why do you think they stop themselves? Um, I think usually the, the artists I work with they know, some part of them knows, usually pretty unconsciously, that if they bring those parts of themselves to the work, it's going to be very revealing of who they are. Mm-hmm. It's going to become really authentic and they can no longer hide, or they think they can no longer hide. And so then there's this fear that if I show up that fully, I'm going to hurt other people, piss other people off, make other people have to look at something they don't want to see. And so it's a lot of it is like a fear of really being that visible and that raw and that honest. And so it's like it, they kind of play it safe for a long time. It's like, oh, I'm not really saying what I want to say, I'm not really giving myself full permission. So mostly I just have to listen for that moment Mm-hmm. Where it's like you can hear that spark, the thing that they really want to do or that they hate doing. And I, I give them permission to either do it or not do it. And Is it then something about themselves? Like, gen- I mean, like some, something that they want to share? Or is it more something they want to discover, if that makes sense? Um, something they feel or have experienced, usually. Like it's something that feels really good like it's part of their personal experience in some way though the other thing that's kind of amazed to me and I had this experience too was sometimes it was like yeah there was something about my experience that I needed to share but often there's also I find there's a link too just with our affinity towards materials 
mm-hmm. or ways of working. Like that, something about tapping into that also facilitates this kind of authenticity. Yeah. It, sure. it always surprises me. Like it's it's really kind of yeah. It goes to the whole cave painting deal, where when people are putting their hand on the wall and blowing paint through their mouth, is that just because it's fun and pretty, or you know, there's also evidence or not, you know, that supposedly they were throwing spears. Have you heard this? They were throwing spears at the wall, at the bison that they drew. Oh. So they think perhaps that they were taking like, you know, 14 year old boys or whatever, pubescent boys mainly, as a ritual, coming of age ritual, and they'd take you in and then it would be like a weird little uh, shoot 'em up gallery. <laughs> or they'd be on drugs. <laughs> right. And then bring them into, I mean, so if that is the first experience we know of as art, or if it's, mat- that's what I was thinking of with materials, maybe it's just like, oh, I can make a mark with this charcoal. <laughs> You know, and then you make a pattern, and put some dots, and yeah. And I know. think there's something about like permission to love what we love. And I find that the artists that I love most, I can't really tell you why, because it's so visceral. Mm-hmm. It's like I just like my whole body loves it. But there's other ones that I love for the concepts, or I can talk about it in a different kind of way. But there's that handful, and yeah. I feel like it's connected to like how I love a medium or graphite or graphite on file folders. It's like this visceral love. What is it about the file? The fi- I know what I like about graphite and file folders. <laughs> For me, it's the, the way kind of like the smoothness, the way mm-hmm. it just flows on there. And then the, it's almost like the silky quality that the graphite right. gets. You can get like little indentations. You know what I mean? Like you can damage it. You can feel like you can damage it as well. Yeah, generally, which is nice. Yeah, there's like this. I don't know. I've been trying to f- figure out to be able to like tear paintings apart more in this sort of thing, but just getting more textures in the work, like I was saying earlier. But have you ever tried to like get more sculptural with your things, or more? Because yours is very much mm. like watercolor. It's meant to be a visual. You know, from a whatever you want to call it, it's not flat, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I've done, textural. I've done sculpture, and I've, that's been, a, I've been, I've actually used a lot of paint on sculpture, but when it comes to the paintings, actually going back to the materials, I remember I was painting in oils, mm-hmm. in undergrad, and there's something I wanted to be that oil painter because mm-hmm. I love the look of it, yeah, and the gooiness and the texture. But actually what I discovered pretty quickly was I work so quickly yeah. that if it, oil just takes way too long to dry. And there's something about the layering. Yeah. Sure. And I just like the thin layers and washes. Just to be able to finish it faster as well. Like, you're, Do you feel like your things are meant to be done in like how many sittings? It's not, it's not so that I can finish faster, it's more like that's just my process. Like it feels really natural. I move that quickly, um, but usually they're like um, probably a total of they're between thirty and forty hours per piece by the time okay. they're finished. Yeah, mm. and you go back with pencils and do you work with like bigger washes at first? And well, no, we actually saw it it's developing. <laughs> it's really kind of a back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Was there a moment with the um, the creation of these, you obviously have these big wooden structures that you're painting on. Mm-hmm. Like, how has it helped you to have, you know, how many of those things do you have? <laughs> like, left, is there any other blank ones? You know, like... I think I pulled out the need, last one. So you need to call your guy, I guess. I need a different shape. More. Okay. So I, What type of shape? Actually, going back to one of those things that... Mm-hmm somebody has said that has been really important recently my friend Kimberly she was talking about when I was painting on the file folders they had this really I would leave the edges so they had those like the tabs that the file folder has yeah and they would kind of (coughs) I'm gonna use the word undulate they would you know go in and out and they were really kind of organic Mm -hmm. and she said I really miss that and I actually realized that 
like something about those organic edges really worked well for me because I think it kind of blurred the line between what's painting and what's the rest of kind of what's the rest of the world around it but it was just a little more organic whereas yeah I love squares but these framed things I can tell it's like I'm trying to fit inside something and it's just getting a little irritating <laughs> okay that's nice yeah so you're gonna cut it apart not cut them apart I'm, but you're gonna try to make a canvas that's more I'm wavering between trying to build something that has an organic more organic edge mm-hmm. or playing around with a landscape orientation something that I've done a lot of landscape oh well, things in my work reference landscape often okay but I feel like I want something that's a big and kind of epic Mm-hmm. Like I want to, I don't know what that means exactly for me yet, but I feel like I want something that allows it to be more epic. As long as you don't do the great Slav epic, like Mucha. I've <laughs> heard about this poor story. Because he didn't even want to make all this commercial stuff. You know, mm-hmm. Like all these posters and stuff, he didn't even care about any of that stuff. Yeah. He wanted to make this damn painting, and then everybody's like, this is figurative nonsense. Because it was like 19... 19- end of 1920. <laughs> mm-hmm. They have it. I haven't seen it. Did you ever see it? The Great Slav Epic. Isn't there one over here? There might be. I think there's one here. Yeah. 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 I've never seen it. I should go look Huge, at it. Huge, right? That's my memory. So they're yeah. just absolutely massive. They were in some smaller town, like in a castle or something. And they had all these giant panels. I don't even know how they make them so big. but I want that scale. You want to go that big? I mean, like four meters or something oh god yeah I've actually done installations where I paint either I paint right on the wall Mm -hmm. in a room like I'll wrap the painting around a room or I'll I used to cover it in file folders like tape them all together hang it up and then paint around the the whole room okay and I love working as big as I can okay so painting on walls drawing on walls Mm -hmm. that can be great Mm mm-hmm that's a different way of like installing work as well, of course. When you get to a gallery or these yeah. sort of things. Tougher to sell, obviously. Yeah. I tend to, I like this too because I make an experience out of it. It becomes this three, four, five day chunk of time where I basically just don't leave the gallery. Mm-hmm. And just paint, kind of bust the thing out. And I like that yeah. weird, that weird time. Okay. It's like a, it's like a vision questy sort of, you know, endurance performance kind of something is going to happen when you, uh, yeah, you know, are like sure. don't leave basically. <laughs> Climb to the top of the mountain. <laughs> right. <laughs> what about getting rid of your, getting rid of your stuff? That's a nice way of selling things. <laughs> <But> <laughs> yeah. These things do accumulate over the years, of yeah. course. Do you have a like first experience with selling a work? First experience. It doesn't have to be first, yeah. but kind of early experience yeah. versus how you felt when you first sold something or remember what happened. Yeah, there's there was two that two important moments for me. The first was at the end of our undergraduate degree, <coughs> the school always had a spring show. I don't know if you had this, but No. It was like it was this important Detroit event Mm -hmm. and so all of the graduates would hang up like they'd have their final show and a critique and then all of the walls in the school would be covered with I think it was just third and fourth year work Mm -hmm. and collectors and people from the suburbs and all over Detroit would flock in it was like they'd pay 50 bucks for this so everything is like kind of chaotically there was not a lot of curatorial concerns, basically. Total salon <laughs> style. Yeah. Floor to ceiling. And I was actually volunteering that night to do sales. And I was in the area where three of my paintings were. Good. And so I watched people write these checks. And it was like I made a couple thousand dollars that night. Yeah, and it's it was crazy, def- isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. And it you, was the did, first time, really. Did you want them to go? Did you feel like... These are my babies. Or were you like, get rid of them? I don't really have that attachment to them. Yeah. yeah. They can go. Either. They yeah. can go. I'm, I'm happy to move them. 
So do you feel like you're more involved in the process? Like the, when you're doing like the keep your keep your ass in the studio, what type of um, I guess techniques or mm -hmm. how would you tell people to keep their ass in the studio? Yeah, it's more. A lot of it is working through what stops you from getting there mm -hmm. first, yeah. so that you can actually be there and then start recognizing, like you said, how beneficial it is, how much everything in your life starts to change. Mm -hmm. But it's like, um, I mean, we do some like several different things. You know, one is definitely there's a, a whole week about the inner critic mm -hmm. and negotiating that. Okay. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about resistance, procrastination. Yeah. Also things like just, I love the metaphor of like really creating a good container for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a space that feels like it's ours, that it's safe. Also, we talk a lot about feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, when do you let other people in? When do you not? Okay. What can happen when somebody comes in prematurely? Right. So it really has a lot to do with creating the conditions. And then like we were talking about earlier, getting to know your creative process well enough that you can know what to expect. So when the moment hits in the middle of a painting, when you're thinking, this is terrible, I suck, I should throw in the towel, mm -hmm. come to identify that. Oh, that happens every painting. And if I just mm -hmm. stick with that a little bit longer, or... It's kind of the insane part of art making, isn't it? <laughs> that we accept that it's going to go wrong for like 90% of the time. Right. You know? <laughs> That's kind of a bad... Yeah. It's amazing. Because most of my time, I mean, there's the stereotype that you're going to be, you know, there'll be strings, music playing in the background, Brahms, and somebody will bring you a glass of wine, and you'll have a beautiful, you know, studio with books and candles and skulls, and, and that's my beautiful studio, at least. But. And the genius, your genius is, like, flowing right. all the time, it just, and it's effortless. Yeah. And I th and the model is winking at you. And oh, it's just magic, right? <laughs> You've got your beret. Yeah. <laughs> but 90% of the time, it sucks, I would say. It's hard. For me, at least, it's about 90%. 90% it's usually not going the right way. It's like fixing things. Yep. Or I don't know about you, but I find it takes a good chunk of time every session before I hit any kind of stride. Yeah. If I get there. Mm -hmm. Like, I think people talk about I'm not a like a runner runner yeah. people talk about sometimes you get like an hour and a half in and you kind of right? you, you hit your stride no that's, that's a real thing they yeah. call it like um, I mean they call it the zone or whatever as well but there's um, there's a word for it for musicians and artists as well it's like that like automatic thing or, yeah like the flow or whatever yeah yeah they did it with basketball players um, I saw one study where they did it with I think archers and like your brain waves actually change completely like you're actually a different person when you get into this mode <laughs> which is kind of crazy to think I mean, it is amazing and like is that what we're addicted to maybe i am <laughs> i mean in a way but yeah and why do you keep making stuff the the I think it's the, the, probably the addiction essentially, that indescribable moment where I feel like things are firing in a way that they don't otherwise fire in my brain, in my being. Mm -hmm. And I always, you know, when people talk about like, why do you have to make art? The best answer I can give is because I'm not quite okay if I don't. It's like there's just mm. something it gives me that nothing else in my life quite gives and I no, can't I live without that on a consistent basis and when you're painting badly it can also go badly in your life I think at mm. least. <laughs> it can affect things very quickly well I feel like this is I don't know if you have this but another thing I notice is how incredibly kind of vulnerable I am after a session of painting Mm -hmm. So I notice I'm feeling, and I think it's because you have to kind of open yourself up so much yeah. to get in that flow for something new to come through that I find I have to be really careful when I leave the studio because I'm feeling really self-conscious and raw and hypersensitive. 
Mm-hmm. That I, I tell my partner now, I'm like, honey, I text. I'm like, I've been painting. <laughs> and he's like, okay. So when I get home. That's good. <laughs> there's this if. Being with somebody who doesn't paint is probably better. Does he just think, like, that you're completely, uh, like, making something magical? Does he kind of stereotype this as well? Or, uh, I dream of this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Somebody to think I'm doing something else. <laughs> Instead of somebody who knows what I'm doing. I think it's pretty mystifying for him. And he mm-hmm. has, he's the type who, he really tries to understand it. Because he knows it's not his thing okay and he's quite philosophical Mm -hmm. so it's like he's always kind of approaching this fascinating creature okay (laughs) so there is kind of a reverence and a respect because he can't quite understand it yeah which is nice okay yeah no it's good i mean and people come to i think a lot of times people come to work it's interesting to see just how different people come to different works and a lot of times i think they think of it as like a code and I imagine with your paintings they could be seen as like some sort of code to break there's even words in snippets of you know what I mean like yeah. trying to decode it and these sort of things do you want them to be read in that way um or how do you imagine somebody reading your painting do you even care about it I do I think that I, I feel like the people who can get into them and read them in some way are also people who are highly Mm non-linear so it's like they have the language to enter them and actually I find that those people don't feel like they're reading something like they're not those aren't the people then who are trying to understand it Mm -hmm. they just get it Mm. it's like the painting kind of washes over them and they feel more sane because they see their universe reflected back. Mm-hmm. So if I find if somebody's trying to like read it with my work, they're not. They're just not going to get it. Basically, <laughs> just, <laughs> there's nothing you can't decode them. Yeah. Maybe. Can you decode them? Do you want people to decode them? Maybe. It's more like uh, I don't know if this is it, but it feels like some people are fluent in the language of my paintings. Mm-hmm. The decoding comes when you're not, maybe you're not quite fluent, and so you're trying to learn some of these languages and words and understand the grammar. Yeah. You know, and then you, you know you're not quite communicating. You can't just say whatever you want with ease then. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, they're so hard for me to talk about that I kind of just come to rely on, I'll get a... I'll get somebody else to write something interesting about them. Mm-hmm. I'll try to fumble around and tell you something that might help you enter them. And and then if you don't get it, I, there's not much I can do. Because <laughs> you did the entire the, um, Czech field guide. What's the full title? Uh, field guide to the Czech psyche. Field guide to the Czech psyche. Mm-hmm. So that was obviously a community-based project, mm-hmm. kind of, wasn't it? Or mm-hmm. inter- interacting with people and communicating with people or an audience or whatever yeah what type of people or what was that and like what type of people did you work with for that project so it was I started it when I not long after I first moved here and so my idea was well I want to get to know this place better Mm -hmm. and I want to do it using my art and what makes sense to me so I started interviewing I interviewed in the end nine Czech people and it Mm -hmm. kind of started with I didn't know many people in the country so yeah. people were suggested if they were interested I said okay let's do this and then okay. I I what I set for myself was I'm gonna interview you you're gonna give me some photographs or images from your life because we were talking about the question of the relationship between identity and nationality essentially like what does it mean to be Czech and how mm-hmm. does that influence your sense of self mm-hmm. so they would give me photographs that they thought reflected either their identity or what we had talked about in the interview Mm -hmm. and then I made a painting based on each person I interviewed using their the photos as some kind of reference or I wove them into the painting. You got the photo from them first. 
Yes. That's interesting. And then it, they got to choose the photos, obviously. They chose, yeah. And then I was selective about which ones I used. They each gave me between 20 and 30, usually. And I made okay. some choices. All right. <clears throat> so how did you come up with this system? You have a certain amount of photos. You have um, criteria. Like, how did you come up with your criteria for it? <sighs> For which photos I used or worked with? No, 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 I mean like even setting up the system to ask for photos. Oh, um, I don't know, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> like, really, I... But you wanted somebody else's, in, you wanted somebody else to be the impetus for a piece of work. You, you like, let yourself go from the decision-making process in that regard. Yeah, I had been working before that with a similar kind of model where I was doing drawings for people based on something that they were struggling with, essentially. So they would tell me what was going on with them, and I did a drawing. Just subjective, okay. here's what I think or sense, or I just let yeah. myself do whatever I wanted. So I had been doing that already, and this one I wanted to kind of impose another challenge on myself, which was forcing myself to not just engage with their words, but with something that was visually important or meaningful to them. Okay. So that's why I threw in the, the photo element, and, and okay. I... But I mean, that it becomes... Yeah, I see. I would have... Yeah, I thought about it differently. Because I've done things where I wanted... A different impetus to like steer the work in a new direction but you kind of wanted input to, to create something more about yeah plus I I'm really there's kind of this naughty part of me that likes to implicate my audience and people in the process mm -hmm. so I knew and I've, I've been doing this in different ways for years that if they're in the painting or if it's their reference mm -hmm it's a lot harder to disengage or to not have some kind of relationship with the piece. So, I mean, I'm also interested in how do people even engage with contemporary art. art. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, as soon as you have an experience or you've empathized with the person or you've made some connection or you see yourself in them, yeah. it's pretty hard to have the same distance that you could if you haven't done that and you can just go on judging them or having your you know, subjective separate experience. So. Most of the people that I interviewed aren't artists, mm -hmm. you know, don't work in, you know, cultural fields. Right. So I was kind of like, I wanted to kind of force them to have a relationship with the piece as well. And why is that? I think because I also want, I really genuinely <laughs> wanted the process to be useful for them too. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to have a real experience that added something or challenged them or confronted something. Both through the interview. Small community, not to assume too much, but coming from this type of small community, you're obviously opening opening yourself up to people who aren't artists to be a big part in the art making process. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that you just being nice? Um. It's not snotty. You said it was kind of snotty, but it's not no, actually No, naughty. Snotty. I said naughty. Oh, really it's like naughty? like implicating is kind of naughty. Like okay. I'm sucking you in. I'm making it so that you can't okay, disassociate you or you can't yeah. say I have no relationship to this. Right, okay. Yeah, because I was thinking it's the opposite of being like highbrow about things. You're actually letting anyone actually influence your process. Yeah. I mean, honestly, at heart, I care about people's experiences and my own and the art has always been a way for me to access my own experience mm -hmm. and connect with others. And so it seemed like just another way of, of doing that, of saying, let's share something, let's connect, let's see where this takes us, let's yeah. be uncomfortable in the process together, let's not know. Maybe you'll hate it, maybe you'll think I'm totally wrong, maybe you don't see yourself in this, maybe it'll add something. Goodbye. Until next time.